I need to do this faster, and everyone else thinks so too. Okay, so that's kind of the background I'm at. And I'm talking to um, one of my favorite Zen priests about this. <laughs> and um, and it, it, talking to him about this really helped a lot. And um, so I had last Thursday off. Last Wednesday was a horrible day. This is five months in, I'm getting pretty good at this job, to be honest. But another disaster struck, I got yelled at, blah, 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 Wednesday just sucked. And of course I've got my narrative going about how stupid and slow I am and old and all of that stuff. And so I think all of these things and so does everyone else. In my mind, this is what I'm thinking. So I remembered on Thursday, and so back up just a second, my Zen practice has been pretty much like going down, 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 right? I don't have time to think about anything except the fact that I'm failing, I'm failing, I'm failing. And I'm living in my car. I eat breakfast in the car, I eat lunch in the car, I eat dinner in the car. My car's a pit. There's mice living in my car, okay? So <laughs> the whole thing, it's just like a new low every day, right? There's mice living in the car. <laughs> so, um, I, I have Thursday off, so I remember Thursday I'm going to take the time to read some stuff about Zen, plus I've got to write a Dharma talk, right? Um, and I remember, isn't there some story about a rowboat? Where was that? And so Thursday I found it, and it's in this book, and this book a lot of you know about, it's called Everyday Zen, if you don't know about it, it's so good. It's well worth reading. Charlotte Joko Beck is amazing. I love her. She's so helpful. And sometime I'll give a Dharma talk about her. Um, but today I'm just going to talk about one of her Dharma talks. And I sort of opened this because I thought it might be in this book. And I thought, I bet it's in that chapter. <laughs> and it was about do not be angry. So I know that I've read that before because I know that I constantly am angry and I constantly chastise myself for being angry. So, <clears throat> uh, so I just wanted to read a few passages from this talk that she gave and talk about sort of how I implemented this in my life to make Friday a much better day. Um, <clears throat> so here comes the robo story. Okay, so this is the first pass passage I want to read. Suppose we are out on a lake and it's a bit foggy. Not too foggy, but a bit foggy. And we're rowing along in our little boat, having a good time. And then, all of a sudden, coming out of the fog, there's this other rowboat, and it's headed right at us. And crash! Well, for a second, we're really angry. What is that fool doing? I just painted my boat and here he comes, crash, right into it. And then suddenly we notice that the rowboat is empty. What happens to our anger? Well, the anger collapses. I'll just have to paint my boat again, that's all. But if that rowboat that hit ours had another person in it, how would we react? You know what would happen. Now our encounters with life, with other people, with events, are like being bumped by an empty rowboat, but we don't experience life that way, that way. We experience it as though there are people in that other rowboat and we're really getting clobbered by them. And this just about uh, <laughs> nailed it, right? This is that the feeling. First of all, all of the people that come to the pharmacy expecting that they're going to get their prescriptions and everything's going to be fine feel like I am a rowboat full of, <laughs> of something that is crashing into them, <laughs> okay? Um, so, and I, I feel like that about them too. There's a line in the drive through and I feel like every person that comes up is going to be mad automatically and of course that's 
because of me, or sometimes not because of me, but also they're just, whatever happens, they're going to just beat the hell out of me for whatever reason, because they need someone to take out their anger. And in some ways that's true. But on Friday, what I decided to do was just say <laughs> to myself, I am just an empty robot. And each one of these people in the drive through is an empty robot too, right? So what I did was I just didn't give anyone anything to react to. I did not react to anything that people did, and I didn't give anybody any reason to react to anything that I did either. And the way that I did that was, as each person came up to the drive through I made eye contact with them, and before I said, how can I help you? I, I looked them in the eye and said inside my mind, there's no person in this boat. Now, how can I help you? And that worked. There's no person in this boat. There's no one in this boat. And that sort of became my mantra for dealing with everything throughout the day because that's really the truth. This is just an event that is happening that all of us are reacting to. And what's happening is the natural response of the people who are involved. Um, and the best thing that I can do is to just be an empty robot. And so that really worked. Um, and that made my day a lot better. So I thought I would offer that to others as good advice. But I also want to talk about another passage in this book that I really, and this one's kind of, is, is a little bit longer, but it's so good. Um, and I, I spent a lot of time thinking about this. And um, so I'll read this passage. I think maturing practice is the ability to be with life and just be in it as it is. That doesn't mean that you don't have all your little considerations, all your stuff going on about it. You will, that's not the point. But it is held differently. And all of practice is to move what I call the cutoff point, so that we can hold more and more in this way. At first, we can only hold certain things that way. Maybe in six months of practice, you hold things in this way. Maybe a year like this, 10 years this, and so on. But there's always that cutoff point at which you can't hold it. And we all have that point. As long as we live, we're gonna have that point. As our practice becomes more sophisticated, we begin to sense our tremendous deficiencies, our tremendous cruelty. We see the things in life that we're not willing to take care of, the things we can't let be, the things we hate, the things we just can't stand. And if we've been practicing a long time, there's grief in that. But what we fail to see is the area which with practice grows, the area in which we can have compassion for life just because it is as it is. Just the wonder of Elizabeth being Elizabeth. It's not that she should possibly be different. She's perfect in being as she is. And myself and you, everybody. That area grows, but always there's that point where you can't possibly see the perfection. And that's the point where our practice is. If you've been sitting a short time, it's here. That's fine. Why should it be any place else? But then over a lifetime, that cutoff point just moves and it never ceases to occur. There's always that point. And that's what we're doing here. Sitting as we sit, just letting what comes up in ourselves come up, be there, and die. Come up, be there, and die. But when we get to the cutoff point, we're not going to remember any of that, because it's tough when we're at this point. Practice is not easy. The little stuff in life doesn't bother me particularly. I enjoy all the little stuff that goes on. It's fun. I enjoy my squabbles with my daughter. Mom, all these years, and you still can't get the seatbelt on. Well, I can't. That's fun. The fun of being with another person. 
But what about that cutoff point? That is where practice is. And to understand that and to work with it, and also remembering that most of the time we're very unwilling to work with it. That's also practice. We're not attempting to become some sort of saint, but to be real people with all of our stuff going on and allowing it to go on in others. And when we can do that, then we know when we can't do that, then we know that a signal has been given. It's time to practice. I know I went through a point like that last week. It wasn't easy. And yet I went through it. And now what awaits is the next point. It's going to come up and it will be my practice. I really love that because this Zen master is acknowledging like, yeah, you know, yeah, we all need stuff in other people. We always reach that point where we can't see the perfection in other people. We intellectually, we've studied this. We know that other people are just people, that they are also suffering, that we're all really the same, right? And we also know that this is all temporary and that what we think about the situation isn't necessarily true. We know all this, but yet there is that cutoff point where you just can't take it anymore. And what she's saying is that's where the practice is. That's where you, that's where practice is to acknowledge that this is my point. How can I work with this? How can I work here at this point where I'm at, where I can't see the perfection in other human beings? How can I reconnect to what I know intellectually to be true? A couple more things about this passage. One of the things that I was talking to my favorite Zen mom about was how much I beat myself up for not being good at Zen practice especially these last few months. Um, and he said, <laughs> and this particular monk said, well, don't second arrow yourself, Tina. And in case you don't know the second arrow story, I thought you might not have heard it. So there, this is sort of a Buddhist parable. And it's the Buddha saying, if a person is struck by an arrow, it's painful. If the person is struck by a second arrow, it's even more painful. In life, we can't always control the first arrow. However, the second arrow is our reaction to the first. <clears throat> this second arrow is optional, right? So you controlling your response to the situation, that makes, don't second arrow yourself. Don't beat yourself up for not handling that situation perfectly. Sometimes you don't. Sometimes you don't. The first situation was bad enough. The first arrow was painful. The second arrow is optional. Okay? So blaming yourself for having sticking points and not handling them well actually, actually isn't going to solve the problem. It is not going to solve the problem. Um, so blaming yourself and beating yourself up is, is optional. We, we do it anyway. We do it anyway, but it's good to remember, try to remember at least, not to do it. So Friday was a much better day. I didn't panic. I just did what I had to do. I told myself that whatever I have to do is whatever I have to do. Whatever happens today is what happens. The customer comes in and they've got one of these giant coupons and there's 20 cars in the drive through and there's all these things that are happening, you know what, I'm just going to have to do what I have to do, and it doesn't matter how long it takes, and what and how everybody else feels about it. I've spent so much time telling myself that I'm stupid and I need to be able to do this faster and more proficiently, and that actually backfires every time. So that actually backfires every time and sends me into a panic. And the truth is that, you know what, <laughs> Here's the great thing. All of that might be true. Maybe I am stupid and slow and old, but you know what? I know plenty of other imperfect people, and we're all living with that, right? So why should I be any different? Okay? I don't have to be perfect. I just have to do what I have to do. That's it. 
that that's all. And that's Charlotte Jokovec is incredible. One of her things about her big um, sort of her, her big thing that she always says is it's nothing special. And it really is nothing special to just say, well, nobody else is perfect either. Neither am I. I'm doing what I can do. That's all I can do. It's nothing special. Just is life as it is. Um, so that's what I've been working on. And to conclude today, I just want to read to you the most Zen poem ever. <clears throat> row, row, row your boat. Gently down the stream. Merrily, 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 merrily. Life is but a dream. Yeah. <laughs> and that's all I have to say. But we'll watch out for the 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 drunk on the jet Yeah, the jet ski's not empty. The jet ski definitely has some. Maybe, maybe that's how I feel about jet skis. <laughs> May the Americans penetrate. Master them.